Hey everybody and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is The Daily Show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus a little of insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Greetings and salutations everybody, welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth coming to you right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California and I am a proud member of the male gender who never notices differences in women's hairstyles. Uh, also here, writer-director John <laughs> Schnapp. I have to say... Ashley's hair is striking today. Amazingly Farrah esque. Fair, like it's got a little feathering action. You guys, it's darker. I come in and no one <laughs> noticed. No one noticed my darker hair. I hope you guys noticed. Let's go to one shot of Ashley. Now, yeah. guys, now, this I, is now, can way you see the darker. Is it darker. Oh my I gosh. Didn't notice. Girls, I'm yeah. sure you noticed. I'm sure the girls did. Yes. All right, it's Monday. So that means it's time for our weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. The newest Marvel film, the final installment of Marvel's Phase 2 movies, Ant-Man, opened in at the number one spot, making an estimated $58 million, earning an A cinema score, 92% audience rating, and an 80% critic rating. This puts Ant-Man as the second lowest opening weekend for a Marvel film, but Marvel's 12th consecutive opening in first place. Coming in at the number two position is Minions. Dropping 56% from last week, the animated film pulled in another estimated $50 million to bring its two-week total up to $216 million domestically. In third spot is the new R-rated comedy Trainwreck starring Amy Schumer and directed by Judd Apatow, bringing in $30 million, while Inside Out dropped to the number four spot, bringing in $11.6 million. Rounding out the top five is Jurassic World, making an additional $11.4 million to bring its domestic total up to $600 million. $111 million. John, what stands out to you about this week's box office report? Well, a couple things stand out. Number one, Ant-Man coming in number one, 12th consecutive for Marvel. Congratulations. I'm not far off. I pegged, uh, I predicted Ant-Man to be 65. There are some people I'm reading online says, it should have been a $100 million movie. Nobody in their right mind thought Ant-Man was going to be a $100 million movie. It deserves to be a $100 million movie. You saw the film finally last night. I want to yeah. get your, imp your impressions in a second. Because uh, I think the movie is just spectacular. I love it, man. I think it's fantastic. Amy Schumer's train wreck making $30 million. Nice turn in. I, I wasn't quite sure. Amy Schumer, while she has a following, is not exactly a household name. And Bill Hader is not known as a film lead, as a cinematic lead. To see them and making $30 million opening weekend for a, for a simple R comedy, nicely done. And I like the film. I think it's quite funny. Weak third act, but it finishes strong, and the first two acts are totally gold. What is really quite interesting, though, is Jurassic World coming in at number five, making another $11.4 million. The legs on this movie are crazy. Like, not only were we all stunned by its opening weekend, I have been stunned, because I think Jurassic World is a good movie. I was entertained. You saw my review for it. I'm entertained by it. I liked it, but I didn't think it was that good. Like, it's, it's good, but it's not a great movie, per se. For it to have the legs that has that has had is more than impressive. And on weekend, on, on mailbag last weekend, somebody asked me, "Do you think that Jurassic World can catch Titanic for the number two all-time worldwide thing?" And I said, "No, I, I don't believe it has any chance to do that." And I said, "I'm not even totally sure it'll catch Avengers for the number three spot." Well, guess what? It's now only six million behind Avengers for the number three spot. It's going to catch Avengers, mm -hmm. so kudos to them for that. I still say it's not going to catch Titanic for the number two, but lots of great things in the weekend. Strong, strong box office this weekend. Amy Schnepp, first of all, you finally saw Ant Man. Yeah. I know you've been trying to see Ant Man. Yeah. Your schedule's been so packed. Your thoughts on Ant Man and what stands out to you about the box office? I absolutely loved Ant Man. I could I could not believe how much I loved it. I, I love the character Ant Man. I've said this before when I was. In college, me and a really good friend wrote an Ant-Man. I wrote an Ant-Man comic. He drew it. Uh, he passed away. So it was, it was seeing Ant-Man was like hard for me in a certain sense because it was like a good pal of mine who loved that character isn't around to see this film. This film was so funny and so entertaining on every a every aspect of it. Michael Douglas is incredible. Incredible oh, performance. In the script writing, just little nods that I know Adam McKay like threw in there. Or one of the sweaties, like Peyton Reed was like, when he's like, it's like Tales to Astonish, like, at, you know, like mentioning the first appearance <laughs> yep. that Ant Man, just little things like that that are there for all the sweaties. Also, just the story alone, totally involved. Paul Rudd is an incredible actor and he's so funny. He makes you really believe everything that he did in this film. I can't say strongly enough if you have not seen Ant Man, Go see it. It is, I think it's my top three favorite Marvel films. That's with Winter Soldier, 
Ant-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy. Fantastic, incredible film. Peyton you know Reed who surprised did a great me? job directing surprised? it. I'm curious. What, Michael Pena, to me, was a total oh surprise. So, so funny. Was he not good in so that? So enjoyable. Uh, so enjoyable. Every scene that he's in. Every scene. In fact, especially that, like, and so my friend said, and then when they introduced this kind of, like, little storytelling technique in the beginning. That is And it's so such good. a good, when it comes back, they even bring it in more. Now, do you see what we, now that you've seen the movie, do you see what we were talking about when me and Mark and, uh, and Chris were saying, holy crap, that guy's Ray Ora. Do you, to, do you yes, see that? Yes, totally. Yeah, there's definitely. Ray, I still don't know Ray if Ray's seen the movie yet. Have you seen Ant Man, Ray? Ray still has not seen Ray Ant Man. Your brother's in there. Your brother from another mother is in there. I can't. I was stunned. I can't. I, I, right as it ended, I, I was sitting next to Holly, and I was like, I cannot wait to see this movie again. And I'm just watching the credits, even before the little. You know, they have the double extra post credit scenes, which are both amazing. It's like I, it's a, they knocked it out of the park. And it's, this is a film that obviously all of us have seen go through the tribulations of Edgar Wright leaving. Edgar gets executive producer credit and also story and screenplay credit. So I'd yeah. love to see, you know, what was there before, what was there after, you know. What a, I mean, just an amazing film. I just, I, not to think, I didn't go in there, oh boy, I can't wait for this to be, you know, disappointing or thing. I knew it was going to be fun, especially because all my friends said, oh, it's great. So I was expecting a great film. I didn't expect it to be that amazing. I was bowled over. So, so now your my, thoughts on the box office? Yeah, my thoughts on the box office. I'm super happy that Ant Man made a lot of money. A lot of people have said, I saw that Ant Man's pretty disappointing with 58 million. I'm like, how is that disappointing? It's 58 million dollars. It's number one. Anyway, that's a world we and live in. And they weren't expecting this to be an, a 90, 110 million dollar. Right. They it's were not, not expecting Iron Man, that. it's no. Ant Man. Yeah. It's like, look, I get it, but it's a fantastic film. Go see it in the theater, especially I saw it in IMAX 3D. It's fantastic. There's a scene that's made specifically when he shrinks, and you know what I'm talking about, the super shrink. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It will blow you away. So I, I please go see it in the theater. This is a movie that they made to see in the theater. So especially this one 3D sequence, it's insane. But uh, my thoughts on the box office, yeah, train wrecked. I'm seeing that tonight. I cannot wait. I love Amy Schumer. She just, she's not afraid to go as far as she wants, to say whatever she wants, and it's always funny, and it's on point. And Bill Hader, what can you not say about, like, he's one of the funniest guys around, so he deserves, well, they Michael deserve Pena, to be, like, in a great comedy. Well, Michael Pena is in Ant-Man. Like, uh -huh. Pleasant Surprise didn't know he had that in him. To me, Bill Hader is that in train wreck. Nice. He really is. I cannot wait to see it. Yeah, so I haven't seen it yet, but I'm really happy that it made a lot of money, because... It should. All right, what's next? In early 2014, it was being reported that Warner Brothers was fast-tracking reboots slash sequels to both Gremlins and The Goonies. In a recent interview with Screen Crush, director Chris Columbus, who wrote both the original Gremlins and Goonies, said that he was involved with WB heavily developing both new projects. However, things have been slow and that audiences shouldn't expect either film too quickly. Earlier this pro year, producer Frank Marshall stated that an actual story for the new film still had not been developed and that in terms of Goonies, despite some rumors that the new film would be a sequel and focus on the kids of the old cast, it would indeed not be a sequel and rather a reboot. Schnepp, are we ever going to see a new Goonies or Gremlins movie? Well, um, I certainly hope so. I finally saw the Goonies after having not ever seen it. I saw it this year and I loved it. Everyone was <laughs> like, is this one of those when you're like, you haven't seen the Goonies or like, you haven't seen that. If you say a movie and you're like, nah, I haven't seen that yet. People are like, what? You haven't seen that movie. That was the Goonies for me. Yeah. So I finally saw it and I loved it. It's a great film. I remember reading uh, earlier this year that Donner was saying, hey, we're going to develop it and bring the whole cast back and they're going to be the parents of the new Goonies. And I thought that was a great idea. Rebooting it, I guess they could do that too. I mean, but I like the idea of like trying to retain some of the old Goonies. So hopefully they do a mi mixture of it and don't have to get too weird about like retconning or whatnot. But I'd love to see Goonies or Gremlins as a remake. I mean, a reboot. I think Gremlins is a great idea. It's a really fun thing. And now with like, you know, what we had with practical effects back then, what we can do with CG, it could just be bonkers. So yeah, I, I'm honestly, I don't know that this Goonies one is ever going to happen. I mean, I was intrigued by the idea at first about the idea of the original cast mm -hmm. back, but as parents, and now this new movie focuses on their kids. Yeah. I was intrigued by it. Although, 
I think at the time I said, and I still believe, I'd be more interested just about the original cast getting back together again right. and finding out there, what was it? One-Eyed Willie was the name of the pirate. Finding out there was another treasure for One-Eyed or mm. something like that. And they have to get back together. They're in totally different places in their lives now. Right. They probably all have kids. I mean, Brolin maybe has a grandkid at this Actually, point. Actually, Chunk is like a lawyer and he's all extra thin and ripped now. He's oh, like, yeah. Yeah, that he's like an amazing. entertainment lawyer. Yeah, That would be amazing to see. Um, the idea of a reboot of Goonies... I, I'll, I'll be on board for it, but I still, you know, despite all the fact, remember, over a year ago, they're saying, oh, it's being fast-tracked. Guess what? <laughs> We're over a year later now, and nothing has happened. What do they call no that? Slow track. Yeah, slow track. Yeah. Pretty on the molasses yeah. train, and nothing has <laughs> happened so far. I'm kind of expecting nothing. Now, with Gremlins, I believe that is a, a movie that is even more ripe for a remake and a reboot than, say, Goonies was. Mm -hmm. What you can do now, look, we talked about this about a year ago, but it's true. What you'd have to really be careful with is to have a nice mix of CG and practical puppet effects. Mm -hmm. Because part of the, the charm of that original is, you know, Gizmo as a physical puppet yeah. made everybody fall in love with that little creature, right? So you do that and then utilize CG for all the movement and action and stuff like that, much like they did with Yoda, I think, in the first prequel, where you use puppet in the close-up scenes, mm -hmm. and when he's got to do movement and action, then you go CG, and with today's technology, it's going to look a lot better than it did in The Phantom Menace. Right. So you do that, it can work really well. And because of that, I think the chances are greater. If it was going to be one or the other, and it might be both, it might be neither, but if it was going to be one or the other, I think the chances are greater that a Gremlins reboot will happen than a Goonies reboot. For whatever reason, every time I hear about the Goonies, you know, requel, you know, that's what right. they call it, a requel, a requel or a reboot or whatever, I, I just get more and more depressed. With Gremlins, I still think the chances are there. Right. So we'll see how that kind of turns out. Yeah. Ashley, let me ask you. Yes, um, Goonies, Gremlins, both classics. If remakes both came out tomorrow, which one are you lining up to go see? I was actually thinking of, you know how people send in that question all the time of what are some movies that are untouchable? I think that these two movies are those kinds of movies. I just cannot imagine like a reboot or a remake of either of these. I don't know, like their kids? I just, <laughs> who, I mean, who would be cast as their kids? It would be like distracting to me. It wouldn't really be like those characters to me. What about the newest YouTube celebrities? They could be the kids. Oh, perfect. Let's just go yeah. to VidCon and cast yeah, them. Yeah, VidCon. VidCon, you should be there now. You should be casting all the brand new Goonies. I think Gremlins, though, remember, Gremlins had the next batch. They had a sequel. Yeah. It was crazy. That, insane, that's though. true. Which had its benefit. Yeah. It had its upside. The, so. the, the re new batch had had its upside. I still remember. I think there was the one evil Gremlin oh, that yeah. was dressed up like a therapist, had totally. the glasses on and everything. Those yeah. things killed I, me. I would love to see. I know Joe Dante is not doing that much now, but they should bring him in to do or at least be somehow on Didn't board. Didn't they say he was like, I think like last April, it was like April 2014 when the news came out that they were moving ahead, fast tracking right. all this stuff. And I believe they said they had set up a brain trust and I believe they said Joe Dante was one of those guys. I remember like reading Chris that. Columbus was one of them. I think Joe Dante was one of them. One of the studio heads was one of them. And uh, apparently none of them could get some free time to make these things yeah, happen. Yeah, they're on those extra slow track Amtrak, <laughs> the non-speedy train. It's like they all get together and yeah. go, you know... We could talk about Gremlins. Like they all they all fly into the yeah. same time. They all fly in, sit down in a room, and go. You know, we could talk about Gremlins and Goonies, or we could watch this sweet porn and drink some right. drink, let's, drink some bud. Oh, let's can I get that extra deluxe tuna sandwich with the potato salad the same way that you made it the last time we had this meeting six months ago? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, three hours pass. It's like, uh, oh, we'll get to Gremlins next uh, time. Next time, <laughs> next six months from now. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And then Schnepp and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Death, taxes, and people wanting to know about the chances for Hellboy 3. These <laughs> seem to be the three inescapable <laughs> truths about life. While Comic-Con director Guillermo del Toro was asked yet again about the chances of a Hellboy 3 movie, to which he said the following. The hard fact is the movie is going to need about $120 million, and there's nobody knocking down our doors to give it to us. It's a little beyond Kickstarter. It would be <laughs> great to complete the trilogy, but in a way, I don't see the world, the industry, supporting that idea. John Byers said that we will eventually get a Hellboy 3. I sell it. I sell the idea that it's ever going to happen. And honestly, I love Guillermo del Toro. Man, I love this guy. But I got but it was only about eight months ago that in another interview asked about help possible Hellboy 3, he said it would minimum cost 200 million right. to make. 
Now he's got an interview saying somewhere along the lines he chopped $80 million out of that and said it's 100 I want to ask this question. Why does it have to be $120 million? Why does it have to be that expensive? Like, the last Hellboy movie total worldwide made $160 million. That means you're going to lose a huge mm. chunk of money if you make a movie right now for 120 And here's the other question. The last Hellboy movie, which had a lot of special effects and a lot of weird, wacky, awesome things going on, he made that for $85 million. Inflation is not that steep. Why does this one have to be 20? I keep going back to this one. District 9, with tons of amazing visual effects, CG aliens, all that kind of stuff, $30 million. There is a problem in Hollywood today. And that problem is rampant overspending. There is far too much money being spent on producing these movies these days when other movies come out and prove they don't need to spend that much. And then people ask, why are movie tickets so expensive? Because the bleeping studios and filmmakers insist on, oh no, this movie's gonna cost $200 million to make. And now we get, so we can't just charge $7 for a ticket. Now we gotta charge $9 for a ticket. You know, I just don't get it. And the filmmaker like Guillermo del Toro, who has a background in indie filmmaking, Right? Who has a background in budget filmmaking? Why does a Hellboy 3, when the first Hellboy I think costs like 55 million to make, the second one costs 85, why does Hellboy 3 need to be 120 million? When District 9 costs 30, like I just, why does it have to cost that much? If really the big roadblock right now, because apparently Ron Perlman wants to do it, right. Guillermo says he wants to do it, you know the stu there are fans out there who want it, if the big roadblock is budget, then come up with a movie that you can shoot for a reasonable price. Hellboy is awesome because of Hellboy. Right. Just give us Hellboy. I'm I'm a little perclempt by it, but I don't think he's really all that interested. I think he says he's interested, but I don't really think he is. So I don't think it's ever going to happen. What do you think? I think it's a, that that uh, because it's the third movie, they want to outdo the first two movies. Sure. And it's really, I agree with you. I think I you know, I'm not Guillermo by any stretch of any imagination. So <laughs> I'd I love. I was actually sitting across and I saw Crimson Peak on repeat the new trailer right all five days of comic-con and i never got tired of it it's such because <laughs> it was played right across from your booth right across from my booth i saw it all five days on loop with a couple other films but whenever crimson peak with the with the music and just the shots are so beautiful everything is so meticulously designed and it feels like you're watching a guillermo del toro film mm. every shot is beautiful every shot is immaculate with set design so i see where he doesn't want to skimp and I could sure. see that whatever their vision of whatever their vision of Hellboy 3 is, is going to cost a lot of money because they want to build these giant sets and they want to bring hell to earth and have Hellboy, you know, <laughs> fight. And does, does he become the, you know, the evil creature that he's prophesied to be? Is it, they want to see that on screen. So I could see why that might, when they've done their initial budgets, maybe a couple of years ago it was 200. They were like, let's chip off some of it. Still 120 million is an incredible amount of money, especially on a, on a series that, you know, has not broken that much money yeah. on, at the box office. So it's a giant risk for any studio to want to take. I could personally see them trying to maybe bring in a little bit, maybe do a rewrite and have the BPRD in and have like the scenarios just rewrite a little bit so you can get it down to 60. There's a way to do that and still have amazing set pieces. I don't know, it's like, it's once again, it's not my franchise or anything to do is like, I'm just saying, if you wanted to compromise a little bit and have a few more scenarios that were like fun that all the comic book fans would love to see, like the BPRD and Hellboy hanging out, having to get ready for the big couple of giant set pieces, I'm, I'm sure you can set it off. I think it's Ron Perlman wanting 60 million. That's what I, <laughs> I heard through the grapevine. That's half of the budget. No, I'm you know, sure. I got pretty popular yeah. on that Sons of Anarchy show. Yeah, I really should get at least half the budget. I'm sure all of everyone on the Hellboy team would want to see the third one get made simply because it not only does it finish it out, completes the trilogy of films, they could put an end cap on it. They could re-release all three again, get the interest back in for the all the Hellboys. So I don't know. I'd love to see it happen. I don't know if it's going to happen at that price range, you know. All right, what's next? As many of you will remember, in the early developmental days of the new James Bond film Spectre, it was reported that Skyfall director Sam Mendes would not return to helm the new film. Sometime later, Mendes changed his mind and is indeed directing the new film, which hits theaters in just over three months. But according to Mendes, Spectre will in fact be his final Bond film. Mendes said the following, I said no to the last one and then ended up doing it and was pilloried by all my friends. 
but I do think this is probably it. I don't think I could go down that road again. You do have to put everything else on hold. Schnepp, do you buy or sell that this will actually be Mendez's final Bond film? Sam Mendes, never say never again. <laughs> That's all I could really <laughs> say. Done. But look, you know, in, if in a couple of articles, if you go into further, uh, what he was saying is basically, he's like, hey, I've worked on Skyfall and uh, Spectre now a total of five years. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of time to put into any franchise as a, you know, a filmmaker, a director, a writer. If you're like on this one thing, it's, it's you know, it's almost 24 seven work. <laughs> Granted, he took a break between those, but I think he's combining it all together as like a five year mission. He's like, look, I'm that's a lot of time and I want to do other things. And it's hard to schedule other projects while you're working yeah. on a Bond film. You're like, yo, that's like a year. Granted, they rocked this one out pretty quickly. They started shooting it earlier this year and it's coming out at the end of the yeah, year. It's kind of crazy how fast I, they've done this. I one. love that. I was like, can we do that with other films? Like just greedily. I'm like, can we have <laughs> other films do that? I know this is that's a rough schedule, but once again, then you're like, wow, well, James Bond films, they're almost all practical. You know, there's a lot of, they're shooting on beautiful sets. They go all around the world. That's what the James Bond franchise is. It's like, you know, super crazy spy missions all around the world, yeah. cool locations. So I'm really looking forward to Spectre. I think Sam Mendes is a great director. Love to see what else he's got planned to do. So I don't think it's a bad thing that he's moving on. That's just what happens, especially with a Bond franchise. What number is this one? Like 25, 26? Oh, Dennis, can you remember which one? I think it's 24. Okay. I think it's either 24 or 25. Um, Yeah, I buy it. I buy this being his last one. Yeah. For all the reasons that you already so eloquently put, look, he spent five years on the thing. For a creative force like Sam Mendes, just... Tying yourself down to one project. It's like when you're a great lover. You just can't tie yourself down to one woman. <laughs> when you're a creative force, I don't like the look Ashley just gave me. When you're a creative force like a Sam Mendez, um, and and you like and to be tied down to one property like that, because remember, he almost turned down Spectre because he wanted to do a stage play. Remember right. that? He wanted to do he's got lots of things he wants to do. Five years on one thing, that's gotta be a little bit suffocating. The other thing to keep in mind is this. He did an amazing job on Skyfall. I, it, Skyfall wasn't my favorite of the Bond films, uh, it, and it wasn't my favorite of the new ones. I still think Casino Royale mm. was probably my so favorite, great. but Skyfall was awesome. It was great, but it was just one film, so it's not like he's done five great Bond films and now we should have our hearts broken that he's going to leave, because who knows? Plus, I kind of like keeping the Bond franchise fresh, bringing in new directors and all that kind of stuff. I think we're getting Daniel Craig for one more Bond movie after this. And I think then his contract's up. Right. Maybe he'll do new new one. Maybe we get Idris Elba. Maybe we get some other Bond at that point. Nolan might want to climp right in there. Maybe because you know, Nolan jumps in and does yeah. it, Bondfield, because he's talked about yeah. love and Bond, right? So that's a possibility. So honestly, Sam Mendes, good job. Thank you so much as a Bond fan for bringing some great films. Totally deserve for you to now go off and do your other projects. And Bond will get new, fresh, uh, fresh set of talent. So totally. I'm good with it. I buy it. All right, what's next? As many of you know, a big screen version of Stephen King's It has been in development for some time and at one point had True Detective's Kerry Fukunuga attached to direct, but he recently had to depart the project. However, Heat Vision is now reporting that Andy Muschietti, director of 2013 horror Mama, produced by Guillermo del Toro, is in talks to take the helm. According to reports, the film is still being planned as a two-part series to be released one year apart. John, would you buy or sell Andy Muschietti as the new director for It? Yeah, I actually, I would be all for it because when you look at it and you understand that, I never read the novels. I just remember watching the uh, the miniseries that was and that has such high potential for being a great movie. I'm actually not thrilled with them splitting it into two films. Mm. I would personally rather see it be, be done as one film and do it right. But when you watch Mama, one of the strengths of that film is the tone of it. You know, like the way they orchestrate the tone of that horror film. And that's just something that I think a lot of North American horror films often lack. They're great on the jump scares and visual gore and all that kind of stuff, but they lack the subtlety that a lot of Asian film horror films have and South American horror films have, which is it's about tone, it's about the atmosphere and all that kind of stuff. And if he can bring that to it, then that's awesome. Now, the bigger news, I think, going around about it right now is actually that we're the Miller star, Will Poulter, uh, who was supposed to be Pennywise. They're saying now he, because it's, this has been delayed and everything, they're saying schedule conflicts are forcing him to step off the mm. film. Now, they're saying that doesn't mean they're not going to be able to rework the schedule, but they cannot keep the current shooting schedule they have. And as of right now, if they do stick with it, Will is off the movie. So they're going to be looking for a new Pennywise. I don't know if I'm happy or sad about that, but that's an interesting development. Anyway, what do you think about this guy directing It? I absolutely love it. I loved Mama, and what a 
horrifying horror film. Not as it's just like about losing your children and it's just like so much emotion and the tone of it was spot on and it had a, it was way more than just jump scares. It was frightening. But just if you haven't seen Mama and you're a horror fan, see that movie because it'll just get under your skin and it's really got a great terrifying ending. So, and speaking of Del Toro, Del Toro actually produced that. Guillermo Del Toro yes. produced that film. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, and I like the films generally that Guillermo produces, even though it's not doesn't have his touch on it. He like kind of oversees these films. This one was great. I think I like the idea of splitting it up because. It, I, my guess is it, the first film will cover it when they're children. Yeah. And it'll just only be about their, them being children and being terrified by that. We float and all that <laughs> freaky, weird stuff. It's freakishly strange and horrifying, especially if they get into the kids' aspect of it. Horrifying. Second film will be them as adults. It's still around. They've got to confront it. I think that's that could be a great way to do it. Instead of combining it like a the good miniseries, point. just make them stand alone like, Bam, we're in like 1980, and now, poof, we're in like 2016, or however they decide to break it up time-wise or whatever. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for them getting this director, because I think, I mean, I think Fukunaga, Fukunawa was going to add, that's his name, right? Fukunawa? Fukunaga. Yeah, Fukunaga. Um, great director. Uh, true detective. Standout, standout uh, direction. I'm looking forward to whatever he does next. But this director that they just got just – feels better for me as like a of like if I was going to see a remake from it because when you watch it the TV series not to say it's flat it's just got that kind of TV feel to it right if you bring this guy in he's all about tone and mood and setting it's going to be creepy so I'm all for it I, I and I like the idea of splitting it too so I'm happy they got this guy I think so you're right can we bring up that image for uh for the uh for this story again let's bring up that image for a second there. I think we can all agree we absolutely must bring Amy Rose Eisenbach to see this movie uh, <laughs> with us when it's time. That's right. I want to see her freaking out. <laughs> Pennywise! Ah! She'll be like high crying. It'll be awesome. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on in your questions, and we'll see if we can get your question on Movie Talk Monday through Friday or maybe on Mailbag on our weekend show. So for now, Ashley, what do we got in the mailbag? Owen Curtis writes, I have noticed that until the release of The Wolf of Wall Street, the last major theatrical release over three hours was The Return of the King. That's a 10-year gap, which is clear to me that studios are pressuring filmmakers to shorten their runtime more than ever before. Just look at the production problems of the film Margaret. While there are some movies that don't deserve to be anywhere near their runtime, cough, Transformers, cough, I feel like this <laughs> pressure can be detrimental to films that would earn its runtime and wouldn't need to be a TV mini miniseries. Do you share my sentiments or do you feel that more streamlined films will be better for moviegoers and the industry itself? One of the things that I love so much about movies, and this often comes up in talking with comparison these days that people want to compare television shows to movies. They really are two completely different things because as we often say, in television, you know, how many t times do you hear in a TV series, yeah, the first season was kind of weak, or the first six episodes, or like one of my all-time favorite shows, Spartacus, the first three episodes, some of the worst television in film history, turns into one of my all-time favorite shows. You have hours and hours and hours and years sometimes of time to develop and tell your story however you want to tell it, right? Movie making is a completely different art because in movie making, you have roughly two hours, to introduce your characters, introduce the world that they're in and the context in which they're in, bring us up to date on what the, the story and the plot is going to be, have all of it start to flesh out, bring all those things to resolution and have your ending, and you get two hours to do that all. Totally different level of skill, different level of storytelling you gotta do to tell a compelling, deep, rich, character-driven story, two hours, not 25 episodes, not however many years you have. Now, I'm not just not to say one is better than the other, just highlighting these are two totally different mediums. A number of years ago, uh, on the recommendation of uh, Quentin Tarantino, actually, um, there's this film workshop in Hollywood that guys like Tarantino have been to, a lot of Hollywood filmmakers have been to, by a guy by the name of Dove S.S. Simmons. He runs this like three-day filmmakers workshop. And I remember him saying, now, I'm just telling you what he said. I'm not saying it's necessarily right or wrong. But one of the things uh, he said in the workshop was that if you can't tell your story in two hours, then the problem is with you as a storyteller. 
And I thought that was really interesting to say. Now, he went on to specify that, look, that doesn't mean that some movies don't, won't then, say, justify an extra 20 minutes or, or just make it 90 minutes in cases of comedy and stuff like that. But a movie does not need to be three hours. Even Wolf of Wall Street, which I watched and I loved, if you saw my review of it, I loved Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street. But the one criticism I had coming out of it was a little bit like, it could have been tightened up a bit. There were moments and scenes and things like that that I felt it could have lost to tighten it up a bit, increase the pace a bit. Maybe it would have been a bit better. I don't know. That's not to say that there's no films in history that don't deserve three hours, but I'll be honest with you. I think that target of two hours is a great target. Go over by 20 minutes, go over by 30 sometimes, go under by 20, 30. That's fine, but I think that target is a good one to, to do. It means that theaters can play more screenings of the movies that are out there. It forces the filmmakers to be more concise and more compact and more tight in their storytelling. And I think that's good for audiences. So while this isn't a, just a across-the-board rule, I think generally speaking, yeah, you, you don't go for three hours. That's just my personal opinion. Love to know what you think, but more importantly, I want to know what you think as a filmmaker. What do you uh, think? You know, I agree. I think uh, like what you said was great. I mean, because making a movie and making a TV series is completely different. I look at TV series as every TV series is a soap opera. In oh, that yeah. it's, it's basically you get a chance to like, you're getting into the characters lives. You get to see them making breakfast. Everything is like, it's a lot slower paced. Even in a fast paced film, you're seeing aspects of their lives that are usually cut out of films. Just like when, you know, uh, they say like, you don't have to see the person get out of the car and walk to the door and ring the doorbell. You can usually just cut to them entering the apartment right you don't even have to have them entering the apartment you can have them seated already in mid-conversation there's all these different things where you cut out uh you know time wasting stuff in a certain sense but in a in a tv show it's not time wasting because you're building character they could be on a call while they're walking to ring the doorbell i'm just saying it's like you have a lot more pacing issues that aren't in television that you have in films and that's just now, when you're writing a screenplay, you're not even thinking about that. You're like, you're act one, act two, act three. Right. It's a whole other dis uh, structure of how you write and how you conceptualize a film versus how you conceptualize making, writing, or directing a TV series. So you're like, usually within a TV series, you're part of a whole. Like as me as a director, I've worked with other directors who are doing other episodes. So we're like, hey, let's make sure like part of us, part of our, what our overall thing meshes, and then we can each have our own distinctive style for these specific mm. scenes. So as, as a producer, that's what you kind of look at on a TV level. On a movie level, you're like, hey, as long as the story works, you don't want to go over two hours because I think the attention span of the audience starts to drift. If you have an incredible film, if you have like one of the blockbuster Oscar winning films, it can be two and a half hours because it's that strong. It's that amazingly well made. Most films are not that amazingly well made. They're just good. Right. That's just the, this, the reality of it. So if you have a good film, the audience will be with you. Act one, act two, act three. They'll be with you and be like, hey, that was good. You know, it's satisfying. If it gets too long and too, you know, stretched out, like what you're saying is like you reach that area where people are like, nah, I'm going to go to the bathroom. There's like just that break that people need yeah. that people watching television shows get it. They can just pause it. They can go to the bathroom, get some, get a sandwich. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like pause it like, hey, what, you know, I want to take a break for a minute. That happens all the time. Get their so, hair darkened. Yeah. Get their hair darkened or lightened. <laughs> you know, I mean, these things happen. So, yeah, I think two hours is a great place to be for a movie but i've i've enjoyed a lot of movies that are over two hours i've enjoyed movies under two hours but you know four hours how many movies are four hours not many not many transformers four what a fantastic film felt like at eight. two <laughs> hours and 800 minutes or whatever that was yeah all right what's next chris griffin writes hey collider love the show and mailbag watch it all the time my question is regarding a quick scene in the batman versus superman trailer at about 240 i believe when batman's in the desert fighting the superman soldiers if you watch closely it looks as if batman breaks one of the soldiers necks i watched it a few times to be sure and it seems like he does. Have you seen this too, or am I just crazy? What are the chances of him killing in this movie? Thanks, and keep up the great work. About three seconds after the Batman v Superman trailer aired, I started getting questions about that. Mm. People, like, hey, wait, wait a minute, is it just me, or did Batman just break some dude's neck? I mean, a lot of people talk about how, hey man, Superman doesn't kill people. Batman don't kill people, and not intentionally. And Batman don't tolerate. I mean, actually, if you go into, I know I talk about the story all the time, but guys, seriously, read year one of Injustice Gods Among Us. That is one of the best comic series 
like I've read since the Age of Apocalypse. It's it's incredible. But one of the things that makes Batman turn on Superman is that Superman kills the Joker. It's like that is a line we do not cross, right? Now, we get into now we have an older Batman, maybe a more pissed off Batman, all that kind of stuff. Maybe he's changed. Maybe now he's okay with killing people. I don't know. But there are a lot of possibilities here. Possibility number one that some people suggest to me, some people don't think that was actually Batman. I do think it was Batman in the desert. Some people thought that was just somebody in a Batman costume. I think it is Batman. We Remember they released that one close-up shot, too, of Batman's face with the desert yeah, goggles? That's Batman. It's Batman. So then what are some other things? Well, number two, Batman's just so good, he knows how to do the neck snapping that, kind of motion that just what, knocks somebody that's out. That's what I feel. I think it's like you go to, like, especially, like you mentioned, uh, year one, read uh, read Batman, The Dark Knight Returns from Frank Miller. He's like, he studied how to, like, I've just snapped your bones, I broke your ribs. I, he knows how to take people out without killing them. Right. And that's his skill set where he can be like, I snapped your neck. You're going to be, a, you know, a quadriplegic, which is, you know, that's isn't that horrible enough? Like, but you're alive, you're alive. You know, so I don't think he killed anybody in that this fight scene. That would be my guess. Now, the other options, though, because we don't know anything about these Superman soldiers. Number one, maybe they're androids. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something that 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 Luther Corps put together. So or maybe there's some kind of like, you know, genetically engineered artificial people. Whatever. Lots of things that the movies love to do. So like Transformers, where the Transformers can go around and shove blades through each other's guts and tear out their innards and cut off their heads. But it doesn't really matter because it's robots, so that's cool. So maybe there's something like that involved. I think it's more what you're saying, though. I think it's probably more along the lines of Batman. To us, it looks like he's killing him. But Batman is smarter than us. He knows how to do it just in such a way that it de de debilitates them. I was going to say decapitates them. Debilitates them and renders them inert and unable to move for like the next two hours or something like that. We'll, we'll have to wait and see the movie. Right. Did you see any other options there? No, I think that's the main option. I don't think he killed him. So, I mean, that would just, I mean, it, yeah, he definitely like cracked his neck and put him out. That's obvious, but... I don't think Batman's just like snapping people's necks. Like, yep, yeah, no, number 484, <laughs> 485, chalking them off because I murder people. I don't think that's what Batman does. So That symbol on your chest that's means right. hope. This symbol means murder. I, I snapping necks. That's Love what this bat symbol me means. Love some murder. Yeah. All right, what's next? <laughs> Fabian Suarez writes, love the show as always. I've been reading a lot about Ghostbusters fans being upset about the new Ghostbusters reboot. From my understanding, it is not the female casting that upsets fans. It is the fact that they will not acknowledge the previous two films or its founding fathers. Why do studios do things that will not appeal to the core fan base? Why doesn't a beloved franchise like Ghostbusters get the same love and continuation like the new Star Wars saga? How would Star Wars fans feel if they announced that they were going to reboot Star Wars or recast one of the main actors with a different cast. Would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I think, number one, it should be mentioned here that I believe they've already confirmed that Dan Aykroyd will make at least a cameo in the new one. Now, whether he'll be playing, uh, he wasn't Bankman. Well, who's his character? Stance. Okay, okay. There you, oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, whether he'll be playing mm -hmm. his actual character from the original Ghostbusters and they acknowledge the previous existence of Ghostbusters or whether it's just a random cameo, we don't know yet. But here's what it comes down to. Us in the fan community, and I'm including myself in this, trust me, I'm as guilty as this of anybody, okay? What we often feel as fans of anything, whether it's fans of Dragon Ball Z or fans of Star Wars or fans of Ghostbusters, what we tend to then start to believe and feel is that, like, this microphone is us. This now empty water bottle is the world, and we see the world like this. <laughs> The world revolves around us and everything that ever happens should be done in service to us because we are the core fans, right? And like I said, I'm mocking myself here as much as anybody because I've done this. I am so guilty of this, right? So the, the ultimately thing is why do studios do things that they know that might take off the core fans? Because the core fans don't matter. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. now, should it matter? That's a different argument altogether, okay? That's a totally different discussion that we can totally engage in another time, right? But when we're talking about the core fans, okay, the, who are the core hardcore fans of Ghostbusters? Well, they're not nearly as big a number as you might think. And if they were nearly as big a number as you might think, then the studio, being the greedy SOBs that they are, and like in the words of Richard Greco, greed is good, greed works, then, then that's what the studios would do. 
But the studios know that they're not going to make a new multi-hundred, multiple hundreds and hundreds and hundreds million dollar franchise if all they do is catering to the core fans. They understand they have a great rich property in the Ghostbusters, very brand recognizable name in the Ghostbusters. Now we're going to bring some new comedy stars, we're going to do a new take on it, and we think that's the way to go. And now, to try to then totally equate that with a situation like Star Wars is totally inapplicable. These are two totally different scenarios. There are, I think even the most diehard of Ghostbusters fans will agree that there are just a ton more Star Wars fans out there and a lot more people who are showing their kids and then showing their grandkids Star Wars that it just makes sense for them to carry on the story. I don't think it's disrespectful at all. But remember my, my opinion. Remaking is not a disrespect to the original because the original is always there to cherish and love. I don't think them going in this new direction with Ghostbusters is in any way disrespectful to the core fans of Ghostbusters. What would be disrespectful is if they say, if they pulled a George Lucas and, and I love George Lucas, but if they pulled a George Lucas and said, we're going to take, we're going to re-release the original Ghostbusters, but now um, we're going to take out uh, Ernie Hudson and we're going to replace him with a, you know, a, a 17-year-old Jamaican woman. We're going to CG him out. And instead of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, we're going to have a, who's big and marketable right now? We're going to have Justin Bieber. Just a giant Justin Bieber is destroying the city <laughs> and changing that movie. That would be disrespectful to the Ghostbusters fans. A new incarnation while leaving and cherishing the trash. I don't think that's disrespectful. Anyway, Schnepp, am I totally off base here? What do you think? What if it was a giant Ted? Walking, <laughs> um, That'd be great. No, you're not off base. I think you're right. I mean, I think people you know, hold their things so close to the chest. You know, a lot of fans do, especially they're like, don't mess with my thing. And if you're going to mess with it, make it exactly the way I want. I think they went on record earlier this year and said that, I mean, I know Dan Aykroyd was part of saying this, and I don't know if I believe it or not, but they were like, the Ghostbusters extended or expanded universe. Remember oh, this would be a full, with all new, oh, yeah. An entire universe of yeah. Ghostbusters. Like, hang on a second. Let's see if the first one makes money, the yeah. first reboot. But what I think they're going to do, this is my guess, is because I know Channing Tatum was talking about doing a Ghostbusters, and I think they're going to have, like, you know, by crossing the streams or whatever, you see these parallel universes where you get to see a cameo of Dan Aykroyd from that Ghostbusters universe. So I think that's what they're going to do is kind of open up the wor a whole bunch of different Ghostbuster worlds. So Channing Tatum could be on the Dan Aykroyd world, and these new Ghostbuster girls can be on this world. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, or it's just going to be a straight-up remake, reboot. I don't know what it is. But it doesn't bother me at all. I'm excited to see a brand-new Ghostbusters. I trust the team that's making it. It's taken them this long to figure out how to do it. Let's just, before you judge it, let's see the movie. Like you have the person who wrote this is is kind of like you know advanced sweating about something like what relax you don't know what the film's about yet you haven't even you have have you read the screenplay like you're just advanced worrying about stuff stop worrying about it let let the movie get made then go see it and then we'll talk about it I think this it doesn't even matter you know really and I think it's cool to have an opinion like right now. If your opinion is that it would have been cool if they just continued on with Ghostbusters, sure. that's cool. And yeah. say, hey, I'm concerned that they're not doing that. That's cool, too. Wait, like, hey, look, I don't like the look of the new apocalypse. I'm still looking forward to the movie, and maybe it'll turn out that that look is perfect. But this sort of thing reminds me a lot of, like, how great, how great were the Lord of the Rings films, right? Awesome, right? Yeah. But there were a lot of core fans that were like, there's no Tom Bombadil, therefore this is not my Lord of the Rings. It's right. like, you know, just watch the movie, enjoy it for what it is. Let's see if they give us a look. Uh, I, you say, how would Star Wars fans? I'm on record. Nothing in mo is more important in me, to me in my life than Star Wars, all right? And I'm on record. I'm fine with the reboot. I'm totally fine with the reboot because I'll still have my original treasured thing. So I let's just take a deep breath. Let's not worry about... You know, the studios aren't catering to us as the core fans. Okay, well, maybe they'll give us something better. The Avengers films, none of them follow the source material to the letter. Right, none, of none of them do. And they've given us amazing material. So I think we just need to step back, voice the things we're concerned about, be worried about this, that, or they have an opinion, and then say, but we're willing to put that all that on the shelf and see how the movie turns out. And, uh, and then we go from there. Yeah. All right, folks, so well, that'll do it for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies are playing at our friends over there at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Want to keep up to date on what we're doing here? Best way to do it 
Subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll keep you up to date on Movie Talk, Jedi Council, of course, Heroes, which is another episode of that is coming tomorrow, Mailbag, and all the other things that we do around here. Make sure you keep up to, do, up to date with that. And if you want up to the minute, always know what's going on in the world of movies or in the world of entertainment, go to Collider.com and add Collider to your bookmarks bar. Great team of writers over there. Always keeping you up to date on what's going on. Make sure you check out the website there. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me at Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. Uh, check out uh, Heroes tomorrow and hashtag Collider Heroes, your questions. I'm putting together the notes today, so maybe we'll pick your question, make it good. And uh, definitely, if you want to see my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, go to www.tdoslwh.com, support independent film, and buy my film, either digital download or Blu-ray or DVD. I, I appreciate you guys going to my site to get the film. Thank you. And of course, our lovely and darker haired host today, Miss Ashley Mova, <gasps> with their stunning, deep brunette love. It's so Thank amazing. You guys. It's different. Thank it's, you. You <laughs> looked so different. It's we couldn't so different. we couldn't figure it out. We were like, what did she do? And that's why I, I, knew, I know we didn't mention the hair, but it was like because we were so stunned and freaked oh, out. Oh, like, okay. Like gear in the headlights. <laughs> okay. Like she did something amazingly different. I don't know what it is. I can't mention it. I'd feel weird if I said something <laughs> and then she brought it up and we we're like, of course, it's the hair. That's what it was. Obviously. Yeah. Ashley Mova, where can people find you? You guys can let me know if you see the difference on Twitter <laughs> and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And I want to thank the other guys in the room. We got Ray, we got Dennis, we got Wendy Lee over there. And thank you most of all to you guys. Remember, the most important part of the show is not what's, uh, what us idiots have to say up here. It's what you have to say. Jump in the comments section and let us know your thoughts and opinions on any or all the topics we discuss here today. You can find me on Facebook and on Twitter just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. For Collider Video, my name's John Campia. And until next time. Bye-bye.